Hi, my name is David Fallis, and I'm a member of the WebSphere application server for ZOS development team in Poughkeepsie, New York. This is the second in a series of video lessons designed to introduce you to WebSphere application server. Here we will focus on WebSphere application server running on the ZOS operating system. Now we're ready to look more closely at the split JVM model. We start by painting a picture of the single JVM application server model used on the other platforms supported by WAS. We see that in that model the listener ports, the lower level IBM plumbing code, and the open standard API support are all hosted within the same environment, be that a Unix process or a Windows service. Your application is then added to this. In WAS ZOS, the lower level plumbing code, as well as the listener ports, are hosted within their own address space and JVM environment. This we call the controller or the controller region. Some abbreviate that and call it simply the CR. Note that the higher level open standard support and your applications have not yet entered the picture. A request queuing mechanism is added. As you'll soon see, this is ZWLM. The higher level open standard support and the application containers are hosted in an address space with a JVM separate from the controller. This we call the servant or servant region, or SR for short. And that is the split JVM model of WAS ZOS. You may be thinking, okay, I see what it is. I'm still not clear on why I should care. That we'll explore next. The first value statement has to do with the ability to dynamically create additional servant regions based on ZWLM goals. Imagine an environment with a controller and a servant with ZWLM between the two. Requests are coming in and being serviced. ZWLM is watching all the activity on the system while keeping an eye on the service goals you've defined for everything, including WAS. At this level of requests, everything is fine. ZWLM sees the goals as being met. Now imagine things speed up quite a bit. ZWLM sees that some of the goals are not being met quite as well as before. Still, ZWLM takes no action. For the moment, it sees things as in the yellow, but not yet requiring further attention. Then things really pick up. ZWLM sees the goals now as unmet, so it takes action. It automatically starts up a second servant region that second servant region has its own ZWM work queue. The controller is taking in the work as before, but now it has two servants prepared to take the work and process it. So the controller distributes across the servant regions. ZWM sees the results and determines the goals are back down to a manageable state. Before we go on, we feel it's important to make two points. First, this behavior is controlled by you. By default, only one servant will be started. You configure the ability to start multiple. You configure the minimum and maximum. Second, there's more sophistication than we're showing you at this point. The upcoming 401 series will go into a lot more detail on the inner workings of this system. The work slows down, and ZWM now sees the goals as being entirely met. At this point, the second servant region is deemed as unnecessary, so ZWM shuts down the second servant region. No work is lost, the work is allowed to complete before the servant comes down. The controller now places incoming work on the remaining ZWM work queue for the remaining servant region. What we just illustrated is a kind of dynamic scalability with ZWLM acting as the judge of when additional resources are needed. This is one of the governing philosophies of ZOS. It's a shared system with an objective of pushing resource utilizations fairly high. ZWLM watches over all of it. It's a complete system view of things. Another value of the split JVM model is that it creates a kind of vertical cluster for availability. Suppose we have a controller with two servant regions. ZWM maintains a set of work queues for each servant. To the outside world, this looks like a single server since there is the single set of listener ports out front. Behind the controller, there is in fact two application JVMs that are available to service the requests. By default, work will flow to only one of the servant regions provided the ZWM goals are being met. The other JVM is active and idle and ready to take work immediately if needed. Imagine the active servant region takes a hit and goes away. The controller remains active and therefore the listener ports remain active. The outside world sees no disruption here. Existing TCP connections are not lost. The ZWM work queue mechanism is always present between the controller and whatever servants remain. No work in the failing servant's work queue is lost. It's handled by the surviving servant. If you've configured the minimum number of servants to be more than one, the additional servants will be up and active and ready to take work. People often ask what happens to HTTP session objects in this scenario, and the answer is they're automatically handled. It does not require you to configure session replication domains. WAS ZOS maintains session objects in something called a ZOS data space that's accessible to all the servants defined behind a controller. 
The session objects are not replicated, they're simply there to all the servants if needed. The requests continue to flow into the controller region, but now are routed to the second servant. WLM will automatically restart the failing servant region. In time, it comes back active. By default, work continues to the second servant upon restart of the first. There are ways to accomplish a more round-robin behavior, but by default, the design philosophy is to allow work to flow to as few servants as ZWM deems necessary. Servant regions left up will be idle. They hold storage, but an idle servant uses almost no CPU at all. All work on a system is not equal in priority. Some is critical work requiring the highest priority and other work is of lower priority. ZWLM may be used to allocate system resources based on priorities and goals you assign. The split JVM model is what allows WAS and ZWLM to coordinate to classify workloads so ZWLM may manage resources and execution to your goals. We start with a picture consisting of a controller and two servant regions. When work comes into the controller, it is classified according to the classification guidelines you provide. Let's assume that service class is called HI. The controller then moves the request to a ZWM work queue associated with the servant region. At this point, that ZWM work queue is dedicated to work classified as HI. And the servant region that takes the work off the ZWM work queue is also designated as servicing work classified as HI. This is where ZWM comes into the picture. It now has the ability to manage resource access and usage according to goals defined for service class high. Lower priority work receives from ZWM, well, lower priority. The algorithms used by ZWM are very sophisticated, so having lower priority does not necessarily mean the work gets starved for resources. ZWM's design is to balance all resources and all work to meet the goals defined. Let's assume the other servant has been marked as servicing work with a service class of other. As work comes into the controller, the controller interrogates each request and determines the classification that should be applied. It then routes that work to the appropriate ZWM work queue designated to service that service class of work. The servants behind the controller then pull the work, and ZWM manages resources to the defined goals of the work marked high, the work marked other, and all other work on the system. That was as brief a review of the workload classification topic as possible, but there's a great deal more information available to you. The WP101740 white paper at ibm.com slash support slash techdocs goes into this in much greater detail. And the upcoming 401 series will be based on that white paper. So if the topic of workload classification and management is of interest to you, please check out those information resources. The WebSphere Optimized Local Adapter, or WOLA for short, is function built on a capability that's been in WASD OS since the very early days. That function, called Local Communications, is in turn built on the cross-memory services we mentioned earlier. To explain this, we find it best to go back and explain Local Communications, then explain how WOLA is really an externalization of that. We start this story with two application servers on the same LPAR. Each server has its own set of virtual storage. Now imagine a servlet in one application server forming up a message to send to an EJB in another server. Rather than invoke the communication stack, the local communications function of WASZOS directly copies the message from the origin server to memory in the target server. That's why local communications is so fast. There's no invocation of the TCP stack and there's no need to serialize the message. The message is simply copied memory to memory. To represent this local communications function in an abstract way, we use this orange bar. Imagine you have an address space that's not part of WASZOS and that address space wants to participate in this cross-memory service. WOLA is an externalization of the local communications function of WASZOS, so address spaces on the same LPAR may participate in the cross-memory services. This is a very efficient means of communication and is capable of achieving very high rates of throughput. And to make it as flexible as possible, WOLA is bidirectional, meaning the initiation of message exchange may start from WAS and go outbound, or start from outside WAS and come inbound. WOLA is a topic for which we already have considerable documentation available for your use. The WP101490 document at ibm.com slash support slash techdocs is a repository for several documents on WOLA. And we have a series of videos on WOLA available on YouTube as well. Search on the keyword string WP101490 to see the WOLA videos. The ZOS operating system has a facility that allows operator commands to be passed into executing programs. This allows the WASZOS environment to be dynamically altered. The command is shown on the chart, modify, and then the server name. 
In this example, we're showing passing in the help parameter. The result is a list of the available parameters, which are shown here. For example, there are ways to dynamically alter the tracing behavior without having to stop and restart servers. And you may pause and resume the server's listeners as well. The effect of this is to remove a server from consideration for request routing. The server stays up and continues to process its in-flight work, but additional work goes elsewhere. You may dynamically alter the number of servant regions, and you may dynamically alter the SMF recording options. And there's a long list of commands that allow you to display information about the server, which we'll show next. WASZOS has implemented a subcommand under Modify called Display. This allows you to dynamically see real-time information about the server. Once again, we'll show you the help parameter, but this time on display. For example, you may display the work that's currently being run on the server, and with version 7 you may drill even deeper and display the status of the individual threads within each servant region. You may display information about the listeners for the server and what connections to those listeners exist. You may display information about WOLA and the trace records of WOLA and display information about SMF settings as well as Fricka cached objects. As you see, this function is very handy for you to see what's going on in your environment. But in addition, you may use this with your existing system automation tools to monitor the overall WASZOS environment and take actions as needed. Now let's turn our attention to the Fast Response Cached Accelerator, or Fricka for short. WAS on all platforms has a function called Dynamic Caching, or DynaCache for short, that allows applications to specify what content to cache. Caching content provides faster web serving for requests that come along later for that content. The Fricka function in WAS ZOS is a way to extend the DynaCache capability so the cached content may be pushed even lower in the processing stack. The lower an object is cached, the faster it may be served out later. Let's start drawing our picture. We start with the physical network and the network adapter that's used by a mainframe in the ZOS operating system. We then layer on top of that the TCP IP function. On ZOS, that's part of the communication server function. Then the application server itself, with the application shown as running inside. As mentioned, DynaCache is a feature of WAS on all platforms. It's an interface layer that allows applications to push content into cache. An XML file called cachespec.xml is used to tell the server what content is to be cached. Imagine the application is being used, and as content is accessed by web users, the application requests DynaCache to push those objects into cache. By default, the caching location is in the application server itself. On ZOS, with the split JVM model, that caching takes place in the servant region. When a request comes in off the network, it works its way up the processing stack and into the application server. But rather than consume cycles regenerating the content, WAS recognizes that the content is in DynaCache and it serves it out from there. The DynaCache function provides, as part of its design, the ability to specify an external cache adapter. That provides a way to push the cached objects to another location in the processing architecture. This is available on all platforms. For example, WAS Undistributed uses this to push cached objects out to the IBM HTTP server. On WAS ZOS, we've introduced the ability to specify the ZOS TCP Fricka function as an external cache location. The Fricka function on ZOS is part of the TCP IP stack. Once again, imagine the application is requesting that objects be cached using DynaCache, but in this case we've configured an external cache adapter and specified the ZOS Fricka function. Now cached objects go to Fricka. And when a request comes in for that cached object, it's served out of the TCP stack. That means even less processing is required to serve out that cached object. Fricka is a very efficient caching mechanism and has the potential to increase throughput and reduce CPU consumption. All because it is operating at a lower point in the functional stack than the application up in WAS itself. Mm -hmm.